Hi, my name's Viv Rolf, and this is my presentation from OER 15 that was held this year in Cardiff and I'm pretty sure the video capture wasn't on at this point so I thought I would just capture some of the outputs from the presentation that I gave really because I think there are some things here that would be of real interest to the community based on some of the conversations that went on in the conference. So I've done a piece of research to look at the sustained impact of open education resources and particularly reviewing the activity that went on at De Montfort University as part of UK OER and recently I went back to De Montfort as I left there in um, 2013 and I went back and conducted a series of interviews and followed up to, to, to ask the question well has open education activity been sustained there um, and I look back so fondly we had a great time there in the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences we were really lucky to get funding all for all three years of the UK OER programme funding that was led by JISC and the HEA. So we launched the Virtual Analytical Lab, VAL, which was a static HTML site with loads of OERs on. Um, the following year we launched the Sickle Cell Project, Scooter. Um, we took a different approach on this. We used a WordPress blog and social media to, to promote the discovery of OER. Um, at that time, another part of the university led by Jackie Williams in midwifery, who's astounding and, and she's now moved from DMU to Nottingham University. She she led De Montford's contribution in the um, Tiger Project collaboration with Leicester and Northampton and that was releasing interprofessional learning OER and that's it's a lovely project. That was housed on a repository. The biology courses project was then our final um, round of funding and that was releasing just general um, science resources really, not just biology, biomedical science, forensic, but also midwifery. And again, Jackie led a fantastic part of that project, embedding midwifery OERs in, in the curriculum. And again, that was based on a repository. So we did combined approaches. And I'm kind of thinking back to earlier conferences in, in 2011 and 2012, when I was talking about these projects um, and, and the promises that we were almost going to make. And we were talking about using search engine optimization techniques to fire OERs out on the web and making them discoverable and using social networks to boost the traffic to those webs. And so we can reflect back on that. Um, and I was using some, some of the current thinking at the time um, around how to sustain projects. It was all about building communities, adopting open technologies and creating these networks. And that seemed to be a really fundamental thing that we needed to try and do. And we also then thought about the actual life cycle of OERs, or David Wiley might refer to the five R's now, um, and mapped almost how open technologies can, can assist in each of those steps also. Um, and then this, this lovely aspect explored by Dan Tony and others that really, well, to sustain OER, it just needs to be part of what we do. So I think, I'm not sure we set out with those goals in mind, but I think it was in the back of my mind, it would be nice if that happens. So let's just have a look and see then what did happen. And this is just a, a brief review of what our approach was. And it's quite different to all the other UK OER projects at that time, which mainly were hosted around repositories and institutional based OER collections. And we took a different approach because, well, actually, simply, we, we didn't have teams of learning technologists at De Montfort. It, it had quite a different model of operation, which actually, um, used to used to worry me but I think we were better off in the long run because what we did was set up WordPress blogs um, and we had the assistance of some fabulous technology consultants Phil Lanca um, Phil Tubman sorry from Lancaster and also Simon Griffin who supported the SEO so we set up a WordPress blog so when we released an OER it would have a, a web a blog article with it using posturus we'd fire that out via social media um, so that, that was one part of the discovery plan. And the other thing, and really this was all about our thinking about well, how to make things not just open, but they've got to be accessible and interoperable. And it was this notion of not just releasing one asset, but releasing it in many forms, as many forms that was actually quite quickly and easy to do. So, for example, Flash Animation had the um, interactions and action scripting taken out and then maybe slightly adapted but published as a video and transcripts of recordings and that kind of stuff. So that was our approach. So what we're doing now is um, a big review and I've got a lot of analytic data and I'm trawling through that and a huge thanks to Pete Warrington at De Montford 
who's um, given me access to the, 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 the repository project so I can look at the data there and um, also interviewed with staff just to follow up. Um, so this has been ethically approved and, and really the approach for looking at impact was first of all to visit the OER Research Hub 11 impact hypotheses or, or briefly talk about those at the end. In terms of reach, I mean the, the real difference that we saw using the WordPress blogs is the websites got found really quickly and they extended out around the world really quite quickly and for Scooter which is a sickle cell project what was interesting for us and important for us actually that it was reaching those companies where uh, countries where sickle cell and those kind of blood diseases are a real issue so you see Brazil and Latin America highlighted there and, and regions within Africa and you contrast that to the virtual laboratory so that's very much um, a different different reach there and that's just a static page so the, the, and that wasn't optimized for keywords so really um, there was no way that people could google search and find that easily and we'd not built that into the approach so you, you do see differences there in terms of numbers of unique visits and this is actually using the youtube analytics also which you see there in green and clearly the message is if you want to get anything found these days you know stick it up there on youtube you can see the in blue the visitors to the blogs and the um, the val websites there and, and um, you, you can see you know attracting reasonable numbers of visits over time val clearly a bit more because it's a little bit more established but the repositories, I mean, the message there is really they're just not very discoverable at all. Now, there, there were people finding the repositories through doing Google searches. But um, the next slide really shows you the big difference between the WordPress blog and the and the repository approach. And this is what is highlighted in the circles. And it's the, the, the real lack of other people linking back to you. And that's called a backlink in, in search engine optimization terminology. So, but you can see on the biology courses in the scooter there that actually there are there's quite a big body a proportion of the visits to that site were through backlinks and this is simply people finding you they're finding the sites through doing a google search for maybe sickle cell disease or maybe i don't know what was relevant to biology courses maybe biomedical science um they're clearly then hopefully using your oer and they're visiting the site but then they're taking the url um, and, and many people were backlinking to us, including publishers, other universities, Wikipedia, and this was great. That's kind of an indicator of impact, isn't it, that someone wants to recommend your site. But also then this drives more traffic. So I think SEO definitely did work. The Google algorithms have since changed, so you can't do SEO as as intricately really as people have done in the past and the the role from Griffin review that we did of our FCO techniques probably isn't entirely appropriate these days although I think there are still elements of good practice in that um, so I certainly even today still do keyword research embed them into blog articles and make sure you know there's a nice piece of um, blog text and even on the YouTube channels on the on your different social media profiles that you're putting some keywords and backlinks there so a light SEO touch, I think, is still a really good thing to try and achieve. But what about the impact at the institution? I was almost quite nervous in going back and interviewing um, not just staff that had worked on projects within the faculty, also a couple of members of staff that were new to the university, um, also people within the education research community around the university. And I overwhelmingly... The, the members of staff that were engaged in the project for um, biomedical sciences, forensic sciences, overwhelmingly the practice had changed. And they, they weren't even that conscious that it had changed because it, it just so was part of what they were doing. So we've got this lovely quote here, I think it has changed my practice. In terms of whatever I'm doing, anything, um, I think of how this can be an OER, or how, can, how it can supplement what I'm doing. So this person's just naturally probably what I do is, oh, could that be an OER? Where could that go? Um, and that, that was just so nice to see. So I won't dwell on the impact on students so much, but the OERs are currently being used in, in such creative ways. So there are QR codes in the laboratories so people can, um, students in practicals can quickly access the lab skills to refresh their memories. I think there's a real sense of um, even sort of having moved on quite significantly from five or six years ago that it, as we know these are digital learners now there are media learners and they very much align their learning processes very much align 
with, with this kind of content in, in learning in this way. And, and there was a feeling here that actually it's really important to promote and develop this. And also the, the notion that actually having things in different formats, having things that students can go back and review is vital to support learner diversity and, and different needs. And it really addresses that quite well. And I think this, this whole notion that we're not being tied to a platform anymore, and I think that almost feels quite an old-fashioned stance, doesn't it? And it, there's benefit from the fact that students can just get stuff when and where they want. And indeed, staff and people's colleagues were also accessing the OER in that way. But I think the the eye-opener for me was going back and, and, and interviewing the, the colleague, ex-colleagues there was that the, the university as a whole hadn't really... Uh, changed significantly. Um, when I left I thought I'd done well so we got open as part of learning and teaching strategy. It was being talked to about in, in the right meetings um, but I just for whatever reason it wasn't left in, in quite a secure state and there's been a lot of staff turnover, a lot of change. The current education climate is, is a really challenging one. So throughout the interviews there's no visible culture of openness within the institution there and as someone pointed out we missed a trick internally and there were other open education projects going on and how could these have joined up in a, in a more sustainable and concrete way. I think there is such a reliance on champions so clearly I, I was involved in these projects and Jackie Williams and sub subsequently we've both gone and I think I think you know the early days of OER we were all champions and we still are the champions but actually we can't rely on us you know, if I win the lottery and I'm off, you know, what next? So how do I pass on that? What's my commitment to continue to seed the idea of OER with my colleagues? I need to commit to doing that. And I think there's there's quite a a, a stance with universities at the moment. They want shiny things. They want lecture capture. They want quick e-assessment solutions and, and online marking. And they, they, there seems to be a, a sort of currency around that at the moment rather than really investing in what is quite a big cultural change and, and a mindset change. So I think really interesting things going on at institutional levels. And I think what was interesting that came out was there were lots of instances where OER was impacting, actually, and even more so beyond the institution, beyond the institutional walls. But also there were, there were some negative connotations, particularly around the, the lack of clarity around the licensing with, with people that were potentially collaborators. So there was just a couple of examples where actually all the impact hadn't necessarily, necessarily been the good news. And I think this is something that we could all benefit from sharing our experiences of a little bit more. So just to visualise where I think we ended up in 2012 at the end of UK OER. So there was, in the centre here, the dark circle in the middle is really individuals practice so these were the academic staff building the OER um, and at the time realising even at that stage actually having invested in creating an OER, understanding licensing, understanding the technology implications and actually having the bravery to stick your stuff out there on the open and that that's a big step. Those people even in 2012, um, in, in some of the other research that we pulled out at that time, said, yeah, the, this has really changed my practice. And I, I would love to see every um, teacher training course, PG cert, in the country, everyone having to produce uh, a piece of OER as, as part of that, that, that experience. At departmental level at that time, there was there's little evidence of creep. We were still quite a silo and um, the few programmes science programmes that, that were involved, the, the OERs weren't adopted by e even programmes that were quite similar and often teaching the same subject. So that was interesting. But at university level, there was a bit of a buzz when we were there and up and running. And I um, had a champion in each faculty um, and a lot of students from other faculties came forward from technology and arts. We were linking up with library and professional services. So, you know, there was some embedding at university level. And already at that point, um, external partners building OER and, and bringing people into projects and for example did a lot of work with the Leicester Oil Infirmary at that time to, to co-produce OER. So if I flip between this is where we were at 2012 to where we are now 
And I hope if we flip backwards and forwards, if we just focus on that university circle there. What I'm trying to illustrate is the fact that the, the activity and the shape we left it in um, certainly hasn't embedded, and I, I would say from this, has not sustained. So we failed to sustain openness uh, and, and really embed that cultural change at university level. And I think there are many good reasons for that. And I, um, There's been staff turnover, the, the vital people left, uh, and for whatever reason, um, it just didn't embed. Um, I think as you probably notice sort of that, at those inner circles at individual level and at departmental level now and faculty level, OER is, is almost mainstream in areas. You know, it's changing people's practice. OER is used in curriculum um, just without any thinking. Students are producing materials and sharing them back. OER is used on open days. Um, QR codes in labs, um, OERs used for widening participation events. So um, some real success stories there, and this whole notion of buying into the spirit of openness—it's it's really got a grip there, which is great to see. And the other just significant change, and this isn't even all the illustrative examples, is is the wider impact. So um, if we go round from sort of the the three o'clock area involving publishing in OERs, hospitals as co-producers involving professional bodies. So we're, we're involving significant external collaborators in elements of these projects. As we move down then, I think there's some really interesting areas of o demonstrating OER impact on research, um, not just promoting the research to widen the, the reach and the importance of that research, and we can demonstrate that through many of the sickle cell resources, for example, being translated into African dialects and Latin American dialects. Um, and that's an illustration of that. But I think this feeling that um, using OER to promote maybe a publication or you do a quick talking head or a video, if you've just been to a conference, has led to further collaborations. And in fact, um, on the sickle cell project that had attracted master students and, and, and research funding back in to, to, to grow those projects even more. So I think the area of research impact is an interesting one. There were five instances of further funding that grew off the back of these projects. There were five peer-reviewed papers, 31 conference presentations. So again, a big, big impact on these individuals involved and in terms of reputation, promotion, growth, um, the projects really, really have, have dramatically changed the direction of careers of, of individuals. So lots of instances of impact. And the top half of this chart maps this to the 11 hypotheses put forward by the, um, the OER Research Hub, which is awesome. And I won't dwell on them too long. So I think there clearly has been evidence of sustained impact in some areas, but I think where it lacks is traction at university level. The bottom half of the slide really shows my additional ideas for what could be sort of impact hypotheses, really, um, and the benefits of open approaches. And actually, I think a lot, um, a much richer picture of the, the influence on members of staff's teaching practice, I think, can be pulled out, and um, particularly around the area of impact on research. The last area is just to draw out this whole idea of is OER sustainable? Have the practices been sustainable? Um, and really the take home message is, well, this is just so awfully vulnerable. And how do we really, really embed it? And how do we mainstream it? I think there's lots of facets we need to think about. I think the easy stuff seems to be people's buy-in, collaborators, local hospitals. People just get it, just want to be involved in open education initiatives, staff buy-in to the spirit of open. So I think that's really, really positive. Um, there's certainly creep across the institution impacting on teaching and research. Um, I think the benefits of the approaches for us have been pretty cheap solutions. We've not spent vast budgets on infrastructure, repositories, people to maintain that. Um, the, the host, the annual hosting cost on external hosts is a couple of hundred pounds. 
so I, th I think that's really helped the sustainability because the Val project at one point, the, the that server, that old server, um, was disbanded and taken away, and that just shows the vulnerability of, of areas, even within that, the sort of institutional structures. And I think using the the social media and that the search engine optimization approach is essential for sustainability. This stuff is all out there on the web now anyway. If I take these blogs down, the OERs are still out there and they are sustained. But it's awfully vulnerable. There's lots of this that's vulnerable, and I think there's an over-reliance on the champions, and we really should think about how we can... We can spread the love and, and involve more people to turn not not just it's not just mainstreaming it it's it's protecting that isn't it um, and I think the, the reliance on university infrastructures places change people come and go you lose tractions of arguments and discussions that's really difficult and I think the thing about focusing on the policy is an important one but actually there's no point in having something in a strategy or a policy, no good just talking the talk. You've got to walk the walk as well. So how do you actually action that policy and get that policy sort of out there working for you in the university? And I think that's perhaps not not what happened. Um, staff turnover, loss of that sort of institutional knowledge is, is really a problem. And sort of more target-driven priorities, shiny things... Um, over maybe investing in what would be you know a cultural change to more open philosophies and ideas and of course the big barrier to anything isn't it is just time time and time so thanks for your attention I hope you found that useful a massive thanks and all of my work over the last two or three years has been funded by my national teaching fellowship which enables me to keep this research going and to more vitally travel to most fantastic conferences like this. I must thank De Montford so much. These are amazing people. They're working so hard and the projects live on. And that makes me really proud. And I'm so glad that I can, you know, still be involved in them. Um, and there's just a few references to finish off. So thank you so much. <laughs>